it's uh, just two like chapters, but there really is a lot of information in there, isn't there? You know, and um, you know, this is a continuation of what we were talking about last week in Tazria. We were talking about something bringing you forth, something that is unclean, or uh, things that make us unclean. Well, the emphasis of, of this Parsha are those things that, w- that come forward that do make us unclean, and uh, some symptoms, if you will, of, and, and what to do about it. It also talks about, so once someone has been called clean, there's a process for their restoration back into the community. So there has to be an order to how all these things were done and how all these things were established. And we see that as we go through the Torah, Parsha by Parsha, we see that there's an order, there's a way that the Father wants things done to help bring honor to Him and help protect us from ourselves. You know, if we didn't have these ideas about things that uh, make us unclean and, and the idea of, of quarantining someone so they don't contaminate others and all of these things, I mean, we, it would take a long time to figure this stuff out. You know, which I find funny how when we read through modern medicine and these are things that we've seen in the Torah before, you know, so it, it, God knew it. God knew that there are things, just the way things work better. And so these are some of the things that we learn as we go through the Parsha. In this Parsha, Mitzorah, we talk about the cleansing of someone who had contracted a tzaret. Now, a tzaret is not what well, we translate as leprosy, but it, it goes beyond what we would call Hansen's disease, like full-blown leprosy. Biblical tzaret was a skin affliction. It is something that afflicted a covering of something. Now, what do I mean by covering? It could be the skin, it could be the clothing, it could be your house. So th- there was a progressive things on how, on how things were affected. You know, it's kind of like if, if one thing doesn't get our attention, the Father says, okay, let's step it up a little bit, let's take a step further. And if that doesn't get our attention, let's take it up a step further. And eventually get us to a point to where there's no denying it, something has to be done. And sometimes we kind of need to see that face to face. We kind of need that evidence right in front of us sometimes and get us to a place of where, oh yeah, maybe something needs to change, right? So this was the way this was done in the community. I mean, even down to, so there's a problem in the house that everything in the house ends up being taken out. <laughs> it's, it's just funny how we see the Father's grace working little by little by little. And if, if we remain unrepentant or try to search for the roots or the causes, it progresses. And boy, that'll teach us something, won't it? I mean, something that starts off small, something that starts off little, we might not see it as much of anything, but what happens when these things start to snowball? You know, a little sin, oh, it's just a little sin. Oh, it's just a little uncleanness. Oh, it's just a But man, these things snowball and they get out of hand, they get out of control, and then we find ourselves in a situation, it's like, how did I get here? You know? So we need to guard and protect ourselves from those things that not just defile us, but those things that can contaminate those around us, right? Because something, if, if we are unclean, if we just touch something unclean, we would be considered unclean, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are contaminating other people. But there are things that we can, that we can bring forth that defile those around us. And so this is where the community works together to try to bring some of these things to a stop, to try to bring some of these things to a halt, okay? And we've got to kind of learn to submit ourselves to one another to help out in the process. Now, the the thing is, if this was a progression of something that was in the Scripture, the Kohen is the one who was supposed to make these decrees and pronouncements and to do all these things, right? It wasn't just like your neighbor says, oh, man, that person's unclean, so we all stay. No, they went to the Kohen, someone who was trained to discern these different scenarios and these different things. Then it would be a matter of, why could this be happening? Is this something spiritual? Is this something environmental? Because, you know, that could be a case, right? So is this spiritual? Is this environmental? Is this something that they did or something that was uh, put around them? So these are things that the Kohen would have to discern to figure out what to do in the situation. And every situation could be different. Okay? So, again, I'm, I'm emphasizing it's not our place to look at our brother and to say, oh, they're unclean. Or they have this problem in their life because of this. Right? There are people who, who are put in place to help with these things. We've got to learn to just kind of help each other out when we need it. Right? You with me on that? So in this Parsha Mitzorah, 
we're going we're gonna to focus a little bit on, on an individual who had been contaminated, who had been unclean, and there's a process to go through to declare his cleansing. Remember, the, the, the Kohen cannot cleanse him, but he can declare he had been cleansed, right? So there was a process to that even. And we even find Yeshua, after he would cleanse someone, he would heal someone of, of their zaras, of their leprosy, and then he would tell them, now go show yourself to the priests. And then what? And why? See, so these are things that we learn along the way. And we'll touch a little bit on, on Yeshua in this process as well. All right? So let's take a look at it. First off, Metzora was someone who had contracted a tsara. It was called a Metzora. Or you could say Motzi Ra. Someone who brings forth evil or brings forth something that is bad. Okay? I think we can all agree that a skin affliction is a bad thing. And, and so why would we call this leprosy? Just flat out leprosy. Why would they call this leprosy? I mean, Azaras can include leprosy, but it could just be a skin affliction. So why do they just flat out translate it as leprosy in the scripture? Because they, they wanted to, when they translated the scriptures, they wanted to put this in such a way that would be horrifying to those who read it to say unclean, stay away, don't, don't be around. So when they translated this, they translated it as leprosy because at the time everybody knew what leprosy was and they didn't want any part of it. Okay? So it's not just that full-blown, though. Because remember, there's a progression on how things work. All right? Biblical leprosy, again, often thought of as being uh, someone that was brought on by a soulish corruption. Biblical leprosy, or Osiris, was something that was thought to have been brought on from the Father, basically, to say there is something wrong inside that you're not willing to take a look at. There's something wrong and, and you're, not, you're not seeing it. You're not willing to fix it or it's met with, a, no, I don't want to change. Or I don't wanna. So this was something that was brought on to show us there's something big in, at stake. There's something big at play. And we look at the, uh, when a scenario like this, when we've seen Exodus 15, so the, when they came out of Egypt, they came out of Mitzrayim and, and the father speaking to him, he says, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of Yahweh your God and you will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, because I am the Lord that heals you. The interesting thing about this, we say, so he is the God that heals you. Yes, he is. But if you read this in its context, he says, I will not afflict you with these diseases because I am the one that heals you. Okay, so you think about that. It's not just the healing. It's about the being afflicted in the first place. And what, what kept the affliction from coming on? Being obedient. I mean, David said, uh, when I was afflicted, I, I realized, you know, <laughs> right? So sometimes this, this light afflictions or these things that we face in life or these different things are to bring us to a point of realizing that something's not right, okay? Something's off. And, and how, how we can fix that goes into a matter of prayer or searching and uh, trying to find out where something is off. Okay. Proverbs 30, verse 12 says, There is a type of people clean in their own view, but not cleansed from their filth. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. See, so we can say, no, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need that. I'm fine. And like our nose is falling off kind of a thing, you know. Like, no, we're good. I don't need any of that. I'm, I'm clean. I'm good to go. But yet, we need to look in the mirror. You know? Because we're holding ourselves to our own standard. The problem is we hold other people to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. And so this is what it says. There's the people who are clean. They're okay by themselves, but they're not really because they're still in their uncleanness and they need to be cleansed from, from their filth, from the unclean things. And that was a big deal in Israel because... The Mishkan was in their midst because the temple was in their midst. The issues of clean and unclean were huge because if you were to defile the temple of Yah, if you were to bring defilement to the Mishkan, if you were to defile that, that was a holy thing. That brought a big sentence with it. Okay? You did not defile the, what God said is holy. Right? I mean, if Scripture says, even be careful about how you speak about the holy things. You know, so be careful how you approach the holy things. 
So that means before we approach the holy things, we first have to examine ourselves. And are we holding ourselves to our standard, or are we holding ourselves to God's standard? See? Because really, there's only one plumb line, and that's the word, right? So one who brings forth evil speaking is doing what? Lashanora, or, or as well as rechelutz. Lashanora is, the, is evil speech or the evil tongue. Okay, Lashon is the tongue. Lashona is the tongue. So Lashonara is evil speech or evil speaking or the evil tongue, and Rechalutz is tell bearing. All right? And we often, uh, you ever notice that, someone, that there are just certain people that are just prone to this? That they, they, they're just, just, every time they talk, this is the type of things. And, and it's often disguised as a righteous thing. You know? What do I mean by that? We were like, well, I need to ask for a prayer request for, you know, sister so-and-so because, you know, <laughs> right? And there's nothing wrong with asking prayer for people who need it, but come on, really? So, you know, again, it's, this, it's the matter of why are we saying what we're saying? Be careful of how you're saying things. Be careful of what you're doing. And then the people who are just talking bad about because, here's one, their theology doesn't line up with mine. Or their doctrine doesn't line up with mine. Or their dogma doesn't line up with mine. So I'm going to talk bad about them. What am I doing? I'm tailbearing. And even so, like, oh, I'm just pointing out the truth. Or I'm just, I'm just, I'm not saying anything that's not true. But why are we saying it? Are we trying to tear somebody down so that we can appear, you know, in, in a better light? Are we trying to tear someone down so we can appear like more than we really are? Shouldn't we speak the things that speak life? Shouldn't we speak for things that speak of the, the good things of Yah, that speak of the testimony of God and His kingdom and the things that He desires for us? I think as a people of Yah, as a holy people that are called out, we need to focus on the things that we stand for because we got so many people out there declaring what they're against, we have no idea what they're for. We need to start saying what we are for. Because we got enough people, oh, I'm against this, and I'm against that, and I'm against them, and I'm against them, and I'm against them, but we have no idea what they're trying to actually accomplish. So we need to have our focus set on Yahweh saying, walk and do these things. And then we can show the heart of the Father in our midst. Right? 2 Corinthians 7, one says, Therefore, my dear friends, since we have these promises, okay, because we have promises, what does it say to do? Let us purify ourselves from everything that can defile either body or spirit and strive to be completely holy. Why? Out of reverence for God. We don't strive to be holy so that we can walk holier than those around us. We strive to be holy because Yahweh is holy. And we understand that we cannot make ourselves holy because He is the one that makes us holy. Our job is to purify ourselves when we become unclean. That's a matter of repentance. It's a matter of, of, of bringing restoration, restitution if need be, all these things, to keep ourselves from those things that bring defilement. This is our place, right? Someone who contracted a zara because of the contact of realms of sin, death, or unclean. See, the, all, of three, all three of these things uh, can defile. All three of these things can bring a tsara. If you, touch the, if you touch the realm of sin, if you touch the realm of death, if you touch something unclean, this can lead to further things if it's not addressed and handled the right way. So if you touch these realms and you did not follow the instructions for cleansing, <laughs> then you would bear your own consequences. See, we need, if, we, if we touch something unclean, we need to have a cleansing. We need to be washed, right? And that's why we even see certain things like so if a person touches these things, he is unclean, he is to immerse himself, and then at sundown, he will be clean. It doesn't require a big ceremony. You ever, never, you ever notice how some of these things require a ceremony and other ones don't? If you just touch the realm of unclean and you immersed yourself, and you, which would see if repentance was needed, it was done. If it was just touching unclean, you didn't, the repentance wasn't needed, but then you submerged yourself, you, you washed, then you wouldn't bear any guilt or consequence. You ever notice that God says, if you do this, you'll avoid the big deal? See, these are things that we need to keep in mind. If we repent of things when they're small, 
and it keeps them from getting big. <laughs> and it's easier to deal with when it's small, right? So if we touch the realms of unclean, we needed to be cleansed. If we did not submit ourselves to be cleansed, then we would bear our own guilt. And then that would, of course, escalate things. Ezekiel 36.25 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you. Notice, cleanse. Cleanse you from your uncleanness and from your idols. Daniel 12.10, many will purify, cleanse, and refine themselves. The wicked will keep acting wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those with discernment will understand. Again, if we just followed what Yahweh says, then maybe we'll gain in our understanding and we'll definitely grow in our faith, right? So one who comes in contact with the realm of unclean was in need of cleansing. If we don't submit ourselves, we bear our own uncleanness. Check this out. Zechariah 13, 1 and 2. On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do what? Cleanse them from what? Sin and uncleanness. Not just sin. And notice cleansing, not just forgiveness. Cleansing from sin and unclean. Both of these things were needed. So you're cleansing from sin, but also cleansing from unclean because not all unclean is sin, right? So again, these are issues that were important. Verse 2, And on that day declares Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of Aot, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And also I will remove the, the land, remove from the land, look, look at this, the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. Prophets of uncleanness? That exists? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the more we read through the scripture, the more we find that there is just as many false prophets as we see prophets of Yah. You know, matter of fact, now I would dare I say there are more false prophets than there are prophets of Yah. But he says he will remove the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. So there's this day coming that this whole spirit of uncleanness will no longer be, no longer exist. Ah, may it be in our lifetime, right? Leviticus 15.31 Thus you shall keep the people of Israel, look at this, separate from their uncleanness. We needed to have a separation from our uncleanness. That doesn't mean a disassociation where it's like, oh no, I've never done anything unclean. It means a separation from. We're not bearing the guilt of that. We're not bearing the weight of that. We're not taking that on ourselves. We are submitting ourselves to be cleansed, to be clean, so that we are separate from our uncleanness. This is why like on Yom HaKippurim, which we read in, in, in Vayika 16, Leviticus 16, uh, talks about the Day of Atonement. And this was done not just for sin, but to make atonement for sin and uncleanness. To cleanse and to purify. So, so you, uh, keep, it, keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by doing what? Defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. If we defile the tabernacle of Yah, we can get to a point where we're bringing a death sentence on ourselves. And again, people say, well, because there's no tabernacle or there's no temple or anything that's standing like this right now, it's really a, an irrelevant point because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? To which I say, if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then to me, this is that much more. <laughs> because that which was now some place we go to is now in you. So how much more close could you be? That's kind of a, a danger thing, you know? That's a warning. And so these are the things we have to pay attention to. We can still become defiled. We can still be in need of cleansing. We can still be in need of these things. Not just physically, but spiritually. Isaiah 64, 6. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. He's saying if we're honest with each other, even our best is not good enough. If we're really honest about it, we can see, you know, we, we might think our motives are pure, but at some level it's still self-serving. See, so what he's saying is we need to be cleansed and we need to follow him. And this is a learning. And if we're submitting ourselves to him along the way, 
then when the need for cleansing arises, it will be done. Isaiah 35, 8. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The highway of holiness, right? The unclean shall not pass over it. The unclean can't get on this highway. It is definitely not I-4. <laughs> I'm telling you. The unclean cannot get on this highway. And it shall belong to those who walk on the way. Oh, what did Yeshua say? I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So this highway of holiness belongs to those who walk in the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Thank God for His grace and His mercy, right? 2 Peter 3.13 According to this promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. The new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. These are the things that we're waiting for because He has promised so, right? Verse 14 Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him, what? Without spot or blemish and at peace. That means we have a responsibility to be without spot or blemish and to be at peace. That's our task. That's something that we need to make sure that we are doing daily. We're, we're daily making sure that we don't have these spots or blemishes and that we are at peace. Okay? So when I say spot and blemish, what else are you guys thinking about? Thinking about the bride maybe? I mean, think about the bride on her wedding day. Does she want to be wearing uh, like this, this really beautiful, gorgeous dress after rolling around in the mud outside? <laughs> Talk about spots and blemishes, right? No, she wants, to, she wants this beautiful, gorgeous, right? That's how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to protect and guard ourselves from the spots and blemishes and be at peace, right? The new Yerushalayim, Revelation 21, 26. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Look at verse 27. But nothing unclean will ever enter into it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Check it out. No unclean shall enter into the, to the New Jerusalem. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or what is false. So where do we learn what things are considered detestable according to the Father? It's in His Word. If we're not willing to look at His Word to see the things that He said, and these things defile you, and these things are an abomination, and these, we don't look at that, then we really don't know what He considers detestable. Do we want to get into the to, to New Jerusalem? Then we need to be cleansed. Who are those that are cleansed? Those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm. He cleanses us. He purifies us. He brings us to Him. But then He says, walk this path. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having done what? Cleansed her by the washing of the water of the Word. The washing of the Word to cleanse. That's purify, right? that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that she might be holy and without blemish. See that? But notice that the Messiah has a role to play in us being without blemish. How? Because we come to him, he brings us to the Father, he cleanses us, he purifies us, and then he puts us on the road. So remaining in a state of unclean will reveal your heart toward walking in relationship with Yah and each other. Why do I say this? Because if you're unclean, you can be cleansed. To remain unclean is a decision. Think about that for a minute. To remain unclean is a decision. And we read in Mark chapter 7 that it's not really as so much about the things that are outside that bring defilement within you. It's the things that come forth from you that bring defilement in you. And what are the things that come from us? These are the things that, that are corruptions in our soul. These are things that are corrupt within us that we bring out. These are definitely not the fruit of the Spirit. These are the fruits of the flesh. Right? And so these are the things that we bring forth. If we are, are to be cleansed and purified, then that means we are to get rid of these things. So what are these things? 
That which comes from a man defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All things that we should avoid, right? And a lot of times we have to make the decision to avoid these things, right? So for cleansing, what did a person have to do? First and foremost, he had to acknowledge there was a problem. So he has to examine himself, right? So then, once he examined himself, he said, hey, there's something going on here. There's something that's not right. Then he was to go to the Kohen. He wasn't to go to his neighbor. He wasn't supposed to go to his friend Joe. He was supposed to go, no, he was supposed to go to the Kohen and say, um, there's an issue, I think, and I, I, and I need you to take a look at it. Why would he want the Kohen to take a look at it? Because the Kohen had been trained to discern these issues. Okay, So if he was infected, he was quarantined, and he was allowed a time of reflection and repentance if needed. Then the Kohen examined him again. If he was clean, he was pronounced clean. And then he would mikvah, he would make the appropriate offerings, and then he would be allowed back in the camp. Okay? There was a process to all of this. If it was just something that might have been environmental, maybe he got a cut and it got infected. Okay? But that's, that's as far as it went. He, the infection went away. He's good. Right? It, maybe it's just something like that. But maybe it is something more. Maybe it is a spiritual issue. Then the Cohen was to determine this, and then this process would follow. A person with the SARS would be put outside the camp. This protected the camp from being involved or defiled. This, this not only protected the person, befr- the, the person who was affected, because, you know, you know as well as I do, there would be people coming up to him saying, hey, Job, what'd you do to bring this on? Right? So this not only protected the person, it also protected the camp from defilement as well. Um, and it gave opportunity for reflection and repentance. So it, the, the offering is interesting that was brought. This was two birds. Two birds were brought for this offering. One was slaughtered by a Kohen over an earthen vessel with living water, with, with fresh water, with running water. Now, interesting. Mayim Chaim, living water, right? One of the birds were, was killed, and the blood and the water would mix. The live bird would be dipped in, and it would be sent away. Okay? Now, it would also have uh, cedar wood, Scarlet yarn and hyssop were all involved in this process. And it's really neat because in each step of this process, we can find things, um, a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of things that, that we can allude to these items in the process. And we can even see the work of the Messiah in a lot of this as well. The blood, what's the blood for? For atonement. And it takes someone to clean, to holy, to help bring them near to the presence of Yah, to come near to the altar. The blood went to the altar. Leviticus 17.11 says, The life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for yourselves, because it is the blood that makes atonement because of life. It's not the death that, that Yah wants, it's the life. The life is in the blood. Okay. Hebrews 9.19 it says, after Moshe proclaimed every command of the Torah to the people, he took the blood of the calves with some of the water and he used scarlet wool and hyssop to sprinkle both the scroll itself and the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has ordained for you. Speaking in Shemot 24, Exodus 24. Likewise, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the things used in its ceremonies. In fact, according to the Torah, almost everything is purified with blood. Indeed, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So then, the cedar wood. Interesting, because cedar wood is reddish in color. So when you look at the cedar wood, it, it kind of alludes to the blood, doesn't it? It's, kind of, it's reddish in color. Um, it's known for its resistance to decay. I mean, when they, start, when they build you know, really nice closets, what do they use? Yeah, cedar, you know? So cedar is known for its resistance to decay. They want something to last a long time. They use cedar, right? Not just using box pine, right? They're really building it to last. Uh, and it is fragrant. You ever smell fresh cedar? Wow, right? 
And it symbolizes resistance of decay and contamination of the state that we were in. Cedar resists decay. It doesn't break down as quickly as a lot of the other types of wood, right? Scarlet wool. Wool is from sheep. And the scarlet wool was dyed red. Okay? Wool, sheep, dyed red, red, blood. This points to cleansing by the blood of the lamb. Okay? Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, says Adonai. Let's talk this over together. Even if your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Even if they are as red as crimson, they will be like wool. You ever take something bright white, stain it red, and try to get it bright white again? This is what the Father is saying. Though it's the, it's, the, it's the deepest of scarlet, He can make us like the purest white wool. And it's only through the blood of the Lamb. Hyssop. Hyssop was used to apply the blood at Pesach. When they applied the, the blood to the doorpost and the, and the lentils on, on the door, they used hyssop to dip in the blood to do this. Okay? Also used in the sprinkling of the red heifer. For the ashes of the red heifer, they would dip the hyssop and they would sprinkle from the ashes of the red heifer for purification and for cleansing. They would do that. Uh, it was also, hyssop is also fragrant and it carries moisture. It, it holds water well, right? What's the, what's, what would be the significance of holding the water well? Because water is life. Water is purifying. Water is cleansing, right? And something else, when hyssop grows, it grows in small bushes. It doesn't grow like a cedar. Huge, tall, tree. It grows in bushes. So the idea is humility, humble, something low, right? Psalm 151.7 says, Sprinkle me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Why would he say sprinkle me with hyssop? Is there something magical about hyssop? No, it's just the, the hyssop was used in the ceremony for purification, for cleansing. So he says sprinkle me with the hyssop. When you sprinkle with the hyssop, it's like the ashes of the red heifer. For, for cleansing. So cleanse me, and I will be clean. I will be whiter than snow. So after the cleansing, the person could come back in the camp, but he had to wait for seven days outside of his tent before he could go in. Because there's a place where the entire community would see there's a change. You know, he pitches the hammock out front so that everyone can come by. Hey, how you doing today? You the same guy that was out here three weeks ago? <laughs> you know, repentance is a start. There has to be fruit. Now, the thing is, fruit does take time. Okay? But there has to be fruit of that repentance. There has to be a change in behavior. There has to be a change in attitude. There has to be a change in approach. There has to be a change in, in, in this person that can be visible to the community. You can't say, I repent, I'm sorry, and, and I'm a changed man but not to have any change, right? There has to be a progression of fruit. So what about Yeshua? We've, we've talked all this time and talked about how no one can cleanse a leper. No one could cleanse someone who had a tsar. It had to be Yah who did it supernaturally, and then the people could offer the cleansing for the process. You know, the, de the declaration. But the actual work for the cleansing, no one could do that. But they believe that the Messiah could. This is why we find even in rabbinic literature the issue of the leper Messiah. Why would he be called the leper Messiah? Because he was the Messiah to the lepers. He would be the one that cleansed them. And we find in the Gospels how many places did Yeshua cleanse those that had skin afflictions? Yeah, it's more than one, isn't it? All right, so let's take a look at what the thought was, what, what, the, what the thought process. In the Babylonian Talmud, which you guys know my take on that, I don't consider the Talmud to be scripture, but this does tell us what the people were thinking at the time, right? So, in the Babylonian Talmud, in Sanhedrin 98, it says the Messiah, what is his name? The rabbis say, the leper scholar, as it is said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him, with a lep esteem him a leper, smitten of God, 
and afflicted. Hey, does this sound like a certain passage of Scripture that we might know? Yeah, Isaiah 53, right? This is why we say, you know, the, the, the current thought that Isaiah 53 is talking about the state of Israel, even though some of the things might fit, the thought for uh, the longest time was this Isaiah 53 person was a Messiah, one who was sent from the Father. And I agree with that. Isaiah 53, I believe, is talking of Yeshua, right? Isaiah 53, 3 through 5, People despised and avoided him, a man of pains, well acquainted with illness. Like someone from whom people turned their faces, he was despised. We did not value him. In fact, it was our disease he bore, our pain he suffered, yet we regarded him as punished, that's touched, plagued, afflicted, stricken and afflicted by God. He was wounded because of our crimes, crushed because of our sins. The disciplining that makes us whole fell on him, and by his bruises or in fellowship with him or by his stripes, different translations read different ways, but the point is, we are healed. (laughs) We are healed, we are cleansed, we are restored. According to another rabbinic passage, Pasikta Rabati 161, this was composed around 845 CE. Okay? 845 CE. It's roughly just about 800 years after Yeshua walked here. Okay? In heaven, or let me finish the thought, the Messiah was given the choice to avoid the rejection and suffering which his generation would inflict on him. In heaven, the Holy One, blessed be he, began to meditate with him, King Messiah, on the conditions of his future mission. And he said, those who are hidden with you, your generation, their sins will in the future force you into an iron yoke And they will make you like this calf whose eyes have grown dim. And they will choke your spirit with the yoke. And with the sins of these, your tongue will in the future cleave to the roof of your mouth. Do you accept this? If your soul is troubled, I shall banish them or those of your generation as of now. And he said before him, Master of the worlds, with gladness in my soul and with joy in my heart, I accept it upon myself so that not a single one of Israel will be lost. And not only, that, those live, or not only that, those alive will be saved in my days, but even the dead who have died from the days of the first Adam until now. And not those only, but even the stillborn will be saved. And not only the stillborn, but even those whose creation you gave thought, but you were not yet created. This is is what I want, and this is what I accept of myself. He's saying the Messiah accepted all people, all times, all generation for all those who are willing to enter into covenant here, right? In that hour, the Holy One, blessed be He, said to him, Ephraim, Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, my righteousness, you already accepted this upon yourself from the six days of creation. Now may your sorrow be like my sorrow. Check it out. You accepted this upon yourself from creation. Then we talk about the lamb that was slain from the beginning, from before the foundation of the world. Does all this fit? Does this sound like somebody you know? Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust. For your dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. The interesting thing, when Yeshua rose, you know, there were many graves that were opened of the righteous in Jerusalem, and and many of the righteous rose and walked around town. Can you imagine? But if we look in the Hebrew, the Scripture says something very interesting. It says, your dead ones shall live, my dead body shall rise them. In other words, it's not just a matter of they shall rise with me. It is because of my death they shall rise. See, that's powerful. And again, does that sound like anyone you know? (laughs) Moshiach ben Yosef and Moshiach ben David. Raphael Pattaya, a scholar who taught Hebrew at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, served as a professor of anthropology in Dropsy University, said, When the death of the Messiah became an established tenet in Talmudic times, this was felt to be irreconcilable with the belief in the Messiah as Redeemer who would usher in the blissful millennium of the Messianic age. The dilemma was solved by splitting the person of the Messiah in two. One of them, called Messiah ben Yosef, 
was to raise the armies of Israel against their enemies, and after many victories and miracles would fall victim Gog and Magog. The other, Messiah ben David, will come after him, and some legends will bring him back to life, which psychologically hints at the identity of the two, and will lead Israel to the ultimate victory, the triumph, and the messianic era of bliss. Again, sound like anyone you know. Yeshua cleansed those with skin afflictions, guys. And he did so as a sign that he was the Messiah. He did so because nobody else could do it. He did this because there was no other way to proclaim who he was. And it's funny how he could do these things to say who he was without coming out and saying who he was. When John was about to be executed, he sent some of his Talmud to, to Yeshua and he said, okay, John is about to die, and he sent word. He just wants to know before he loses his head over this, are you the guy? Are you the one? I mean, was he doubting? Did he need faith? Did he need some encouragement? No judgment, just stating the fact. He's like, look, I just need to know, and I need to hear it from you, right? Did Yeshua say, go tell John I am the Messiah? No. He said, go tell John that. And then he said works of things that were being done. Well, isn't that the same thing? See, it's with us, he's like, see, he didn't answer the question. He absolutely answered the question because nobody else could do these things that was happening. Okay? So Matthew 11, 11 verse 4 through 6, Yeshua said, Go tell John what you are hearing and seeing, which is the blind are seeing again, the lame are walking, people with Zarat are being cleansed, The deaf are hearing and the dead are being raised and the good news is being told to the poor. How blessed is anyone not offended by me? Wow. Let's look at a couple of these things. So the blind see. Isaiah 29, 18 says, In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. In that day? What day? The day of Messiah, right? Isaiah 35, 5. The eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. So who's going to do this? The lame walk. Isaiah 35, 6. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. Heart, like a deer, heart. And the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison of them that are bound, to set them free who can't go forward. The Mitzorah is cleansed. Again, we see these things. Isaiah 61, 1. We've already, we've already talked about this. Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. We've already read Isaiah 53. But he's saying... He bore our sickness, our disease. He took these things upon Him. We regarded Him stricken, punished, and afflicted. The things that we deserved, He took. And because of these things, we are in fellowship with Him. We are healed. We are restored. The deaf hear. Again, Isaiah 35, 5. Isaiah 29, 18. Again, the deaf hear. And the dead are raised. We could use a few on this, but Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem, what? Ransom to redeem? Well, who has the authority to do that? I will redeem them from death. Death, I will be your plagues. Grave, I will be your destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. Wow. So good news to the poor? Isaiah 61, 1 again. Good news to the poor is being declared. Wow. Let's look at that. Let's read that one. Isaiah 61, 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to do what? Bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim what? Liberty to the captives and open of what? A prison to them that are bound. This is what Yeshua came to do, not just for them, but for us. And then he says these things that he has done, He expects us to do as well. Because these things He does, He said we will do. And then He says greater than these. So how do we do that? Very simple. One step at a time. Take it step by step. Walk with Him and He will reveal it along the way. Just follow Him, guys. Follow His heart. Follow His ways. 
and he will continually reveal himself to you. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's stand.